Oh, thank you very much. Can you just confirm you can hear me? I don't want to talk muted. Yes, we can, we can hear you well. All right, very good. So uh, thank you all for being here. And as you mentioned, title of my talk, Electromagnetics and Photonics in the Age of Digital Manufacturing. So I joined the University of Texas El Paso about 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago. Boy, time flies. And I, UTEP, my school, was very big in 3D printing. And really, I was asked, what new can you do with 3D printing? And so that's when I formed my EM lab. And I always like to focus exclusively on the, the revolutionary, the disruptive stuff. We do very little incremental research in my lab. It's always very high risk, high reward. And we're cooking up new things to do now that we can digitally manufacture things. So we can make structures and geometries that are very complex that were never manufacturable before. And so we can explore new things. And that's been the sort of the theme of my research. And I hope that I will show you some things that you not only haven't seen, but get you thinking in some new directions as well. And that's great. Uh, Ray, if you could hit um, the share button for your slides. Um, ah, crud, okay. Oh, no, no worries. I thought it was supposed to automatically happen. All no right. worries. And then you'll see a button and it says share now. There you go. Okay, so now you should see my title slide. Good thing I didn't go, go on past <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> All right, here we go. So before I get into the specifics of the research that we're doing and some of the new topics, I want to sidetrack briefly and talk about something called spatially variant lattices. And this, by the way, is a horrible title for what we're talking about. I don't have a great name for it uh, because lots of people are spatially varying lattices, but there's something very special that I want to talk about here. So let's get into that and then we'll get into the research that we're doing with these. So as most of you know, periodic structures are a very big deal in optics, photonics, and electromagnetics. We talk about metamaterials that give us effective permeability and permittivity. A little bit newer, metasurfaces, which are more focused on controlling amplitude, phase, and polarization on a thin sheet or across that thin sheet. Photonic crystals, which control photons analogous to how electrons are controlled in semiconductors. There's frequency selective surfaces for filtering different frequencies of light or radio waves. Phased array antennas, diffraction gratings, and even when we make things, sometimes we just accidentally put periodic structures into them. So this is a very big deal. Now for this, this slide is intentionally blank, so no worries if you're, you're panicking about that. And my point here is you can't control or manipulate electromagnetic waves inside of a homogeneous medium. And if we think of these metamaterials and photonic crystals as sort of an effective medium, why is it almost everything we see has a uniform lattice? And imagine what we're missing because we struggle to make these things macroscopically inhomogeneous. And that's really what spatially variant lattices is all about. And so there's a good reason that we're limited in what we do. So here's my best way of explaining what is a spatially variant lattice. So here you're looking at a cartoon of a periodic structure that does something magical. And let's say I would like to bend this 90 degrees. So I wanna grab it on the left and the right and bend it like it was an accordion. If I were just to apply conventional techniques like coordinate transforms or, or spatial mapping, I end up with lattice that looks something like this, where the, the unit cells on the inside are rather compressed and squished, and the unit cells on the outside are all stretched. And so this doesn't work. At least it doesn't work at the same frequency anymore. And so we come up with this sort of impossible geometry problem where I want to bend and twist and and do other things with periodic structures, but I wanna keep the size and shape of the unit cells consistent. And so, yeah, it's kind of an impossible geometry problem, but I don't care about that. I made my students do it anyway, right? And so we developed this algorithm where we can do that and a whole lot more. We can really just tell this algorithm how we want to bend and twist and spatially vary. And it generates lattices that are not 100% perfect, 
but strikingly uniform. And in fact, this now works electromagnetically and has enabled amazing things for us to do. So we might ask, what can be spatially varied? Well, in the area of photonic crystals, there's a lot we can spatially vary, but we seem to focus mostly on the period or the lattice spacing of the photonic crystal, the angle or the orientation of the unit cells, and the fill factor, in other words, how fat they are. What's really cool about this algorithm is we can spatially vary all of these at the same time and in unique patterns and we still can come up with a lattice that is smooth and continuous and free of defects. And that's the lattice that you're looking at here. And so we have freedom to do many wonderful things. So in fact, a number of years ago, I have a friend who is a solid state physicist and he said, oh, that's great and all, but I bet you can't transition between two different lattice symmetries without having any kind of defects in your lattice. And so what you're looking at here is a lattice that I generated for him and it has square symmetry on the left and hexagonal symmetry on the right and the transition is completely free of defects. So lattice symmetry is also something that we can spatially vary throughout the volume of a periodic structure. So literally anything we've tried, we've been able to spatially vary. Something else, while the lattices aren't 100% perfect, there's even things that we can do to improve that. Let's say I've identified in these red regions, for some reason what's in, highlighted in red is very important to me and I wanna get the lattice looking very good here and maybe I don't care what it looks like outside of those red regions. So I can iteratively improve this and what I end up with after just 20 iterations or so is the lattice that looks really good in these red regions and outside of that, well, it looks worse, but. For some reason, we don't care about that. We only care what's happening inside these red regions. So we have a lot of control over how we're deforming these lattices. And this has even found its way into art. We're collaborating with a local artist and she has built these spatially variant photonic crystals into a school bus and we can drive around to different communities and schools and, and show these things off. We even have a local immigration center where the walls we've painted as a spatially variant lattice. And I like to say, nothing says welcome to America more than a spatially variant lattice. Okay, so that is spatially variant lattices. Lots of people are spatially varying lattices. What's special about ours is we're doing this in a way that preserves the size and shape of the unit cells so that it maintains the electromagnetic or optical properties. So I don't have a great name for that, but we're calling them spatially variant lattices. So one of the first areas where we've applied this is to transformation optics, which is something you may have heard of. This is the, a really popular technique for designing things like invisibility cloaks and lenses and other things. And I'll talk about how spatially variant lattices uh, helps with this. So here's the basic process for transformation optics. It starts in the beginning with a spatial transform. How do we want to bend X, Y, Z so that we can bend the fields or flow waves? Let's say we want to design an, uh, a cloak with some weird, strange shape. Well, we would define a coordinate transform that would bend the waves around this region that we want to cloak. So we have this really complicated equation or something that describes that spatial transform. What transformation optics does is it moves the math out of the coordinates and over to the permeability and permittivity. And we come out with these maps of permeability and permittivity that have very crazy values. They're anisotropic and you know, sometimes very difficult to realize, but that's what transformation optics does. At this point, transformation optics is done. It, it ends there. But what needs to happen to generate something that we can actually go and build, we need to do what's called diagonalization on those tensors. And that's where we're calculating the principal values of the permeability and permittivity, and also the directions that the anisotropy is pointing in. Now we have to somehow realize these principal values. So we somehow also need this library of metamaterials that we know will give us these effective permeability and permittivities. 
Once we have that, we're almost ready to generate our metamaterial lattice. And here's where the spatially variant algorithm comes in. We would spatially vary two planar gratings to produce a pattern. And this pattern tells us two things. At the intersections, it tells us where to place a metamaterial element. And the orientation of those two planar gratings tells us the orientation to place those metamaterial elements. So we go to our library, we figure out what all the different metamaterial elements look like, and then we simply drop them down at the intersections and in the proper orientation. And in the end, we end up with a metamaterial device that's been designed very efficiently. And in fact, this layout is a lot more efficient had we just chosen a Cartesian grid. And in fact, if we chose just a uniform Cartesian grid, some of the metamaterials would overlap with each other because they might be too large to fit into that. So it's a very neat way to generate these lattices. Okay, on to the next topic. I don't do transitions real entertainingly. I just jump topics. So we are jumping topics now from transformation optics into spatially variant photonic crystals and some of the neat work that's going on here and some of the really weird things that we've observed that we really can't even explain yet. So there's a phenomenon that we seem to have worked with the most among other things, but it's called self collimation. And in a self-collimating lattice, no matter what direction a beam tries to propagate, it's forced to propagate in a single direction. And in fact, it follows the lattice. So what we're looking at here is a beam is not only diverging, it's coming into this lattice at an angle, but once it enters the lattice, it propagates left to right, no matter what angle it comes in at, and it does not diverge, and it would go essentially indefinitely, and it's no longer diverging. So that's called self collimation. So a lot actually has been done with self collimation in the literature, but it's been very limited because everybody's using uniform lattices because, well, how on earth do you bend the lattice without deforming the unit cells? And that's where we said, aha, what if we bent that lattice? Would that beam turn the bend? We had no idea actually. In fact, we thought it, it wouldn't work, but in fact, it did. And here's a simulation of the beam making that bend. And so this started a whole series of things that we've been investigating that I'll share with you now. So we might ask, how on earth do we make these things? And we've been making these photonic crystals using a process called photon lith multi-photon lithography, sometimes called two-photon lithography. And what you're looking at here, there's a laser beam, and we're looking at a photosensitive material, a resist, and we shine a, a highly focused laser beam into that photosensitive goop. And at the focal point, it's intense enough to polymerize the material. And so then what happens is you just translate the stage to essentially write your lattice. And so here you're looking at the laser beam doing the writing. Hopefully my voice is synchronized with the movie. So it's doing the writing process. And so then you have an exposed part of the resist. Then there's a developing process where you wash away the, the unexposed resist and you're left with the lattice. And so it's a really neat process in that we can make arbitrary shapes. And our, our spatially variant photonic crystals, they're not periodic. And so they're traditionally very difficult to make. So that's what we've been doing. And we've been working with the University of Central Florida uh, Dr. Kubler's research group there and doing some pretty wonderful work. So one of the first things we did with the self collimation is turn it around a bend. And in fact, after we did it and we started comparing this to other methods for bends, what we realized we had a world record for tightest bend of an unguided optical beam. In fact, it was the tightest bend by far. And the other folks that are trying to do tight bends. They're using metamaterials, really high refractive and exotic materials, and we made ours out of glue. Uh, this particular one was SU-8, and so it's a photosensitive polymer, and it's very low refractive index, around 1.5, 1.45, and we got a world record for tightest bend, and in fact, we could have done it tighter uh, if we were thinking we were going to get a world record here, but we got a world record anyway, and that the bend radius is about six wavelengths. So really, it's an entirely new way to control 
photons. Self collimation isn't new, but using and bending lattices using our algorithm for spatially variant lattices definitely seems to be a new way to control light and to be able to control it very abruptly. Now, some of our latest work, we want to do multiple bends, not just one. And so what we do is we draw a line and say, hey, this is the path we would like light to follow. And so this becomes the input information into our algorithm. We then generate lattices with double bends, and then we can simulate, we can fabricate. And here's a simulation of a double bend. We actually have yet to build one, but we can see that the light does very effectively bend through all of the, I guess that's three bends there. So we have a really neat way to control light. And it gets weirder from here. One area we think that we can use this, and later in my talk here, I'll be talking about some 3D printed circuitry. And we really would like to combine some of our optic stuff with our 3D printed electronics. And we think these spatially variant lattices can, can define a role here. So here I'm looking at a chip. It's a ball grid array that's been put onto a circuit board. And it also has some optical interconnects. And the idea of mixing you know, optical traces and electrical traces, that is not a new idea. I've been around for many decades, but it always seems like it's on the verge of happening, but never really happens. And we think with digital manufacturing and some of the things that we've come up with here, um, that it will help actually make this happen. And so, well, one of the things we know we can do is very tight bends of waveguides that will help with denser optical integrated circuit density. Another thing with optical waveguides, it's it turns out it's quite difficult to have these cross because it's very difficult to come up with out of plane mirrors. And we think we can very easily make little jumpers out of these photonic crystals. Now, another really interesting concept that really I think is the key thing here that will enable this, we have to somehow align that chip to an optical waveguide, which means we need precision down to a micron. But if you're soldering a chip down, uh, you know, the precision there is maybe more 50 to 100 microns. And so there's a problem there and it becomes very expensive to make these types of things as a result. So we came up with a concept that really should be impossible that we're calling a photon funnel. And so imagine you have a lattice here that no matter where this laser beam hit the lattice or even what angle it hit the lattice, it would always funnel to a common point and you could inject that light into a waveguide. And so we would call that device a photonic funnel. We weren't smart enough to know that it could not be done. And so we actually did it. And here is a two-dimensional funnel. And what you're looking at on the left is a beam and it's just moving up and down to show that the beam can come in at any position. And we're also changing the angle. Now what you can see on the right-hand side, uh, that beam is essentially coming out at the same point. And this is a preliminary design. We have a whole bunch of ways we're going to improve this. But this does show that the funnel concept does work and it is actually possible to do. And uh, another interesting area this gets into is the difference between asymmetry and non-reciprocity. And it turns out we have a reciprocal device. We're not breaking reciprocity here, but it is an asymmetric device. And if that's a, a new topic to you, asymmetry versus uh, non-reciprocal type devices, go look that up. It's a very interesting topic. So we have funnels and we're working on making these three-dimensional and, and also funneling over larger areas. And it gets even stranger. So here we're looking at a uniform lattice. We have a beam that is diverging and it hits the lattice at one side, goes through the lattice and comes out the other. And this is where we looked at this and it looks like, it's almost like nothing happened inside the lattice. And if we just bump the input beam up to the output beam, it looks rather continuous, like the lattice isn't even there. And then we ask the question, well, what would happen through a bend? Because it kind of looks like the same thing is happening despite the bend. And so we put the input beam up against the output beam. And again, it looks continuous, like the lattice isn't even there. Now, here's another reason that this is really strange and what we can't quite explain. The beam traveling around the inside of the bend travels a shorter distance. 
than the beam around the outside of the bend. One would expect the beam around the outside of the bend would accumulate more phase. And so then there'd be this phase gradient across the output phase and you would expect the beam to go off at an angle because of that. And it doesn't do that. And in fact, no matter how many bends we have, the beam always exits similar to what it looked like going into the lattice. We can't quite explain that, but it's an interesting observation. So along this investigation, we found out that we can actually independently control power and phase throughout the volume of a lattice. So here's a beam going around a bend. Here we're controlling power. We're just directing the flow of power through this lattice. Now what we'll do is we'll go in and change the fill factor of the lattice slightly. This is controlling phase. Now, we're doing two different things at the same time with phase and power. Inside the lattice, power is following this bend. And if we're looking at the beam right here, as far as the power goes, it doesn't even know that there's this sort of wedge prism here. But the wedge prism is affecting the phase, but it doesn't manifest itself until the beam leaves the lattice. Now this linear taper and phase caused by the prism causes the beam to go off at an angle. Now, if we change fill factor the other way, we lower it instead of raise it, then we can get the beam to scoot off the other direction because we have tapered phase the other way. So we're controlling phase and power independently inside of a lattice, and it gets stranger than this even. So here's another bend, and no, nothing surprising at this point, beam comes in and it comes out. So we might ask the question is, what happens if we put a lens inside that lattice? So we change fill factor to be in the shape of a lens. Well, here's what happens. It actually focuses that beam. But notice inside the lattice, focusing is not happening here. But that's because refraction is turned off. Refraction does not happen. Traditional refraction does not happen inside of a self-collimating photonic crystal, but it is affecting the phase. So the beam goes through this, the power just turns the bend. We've controlled phase in a way that would focus, but it doesn't until it leaves the lattice, refraction is turned back on, and now it focuses. And so one other thing we did for fun, what if we did the same lattice, but we injected the beam at an angle? Well, it comes out at that same angle. It has preserved this sort of linear taper of phase at the input phase and recreated at the output phase in addition to the phase from the lens. And so that's very interesting. And this is what we're working on right now is looking at the imaging properties of these lenses embedded in these photonic crystals. Well, the door swings both ways. If we can self-collimate a beam in a lattice, we can self-uncollimate it. And so in a self-uncollimating lattice, when a beam goes into this lattice, the power just goes everywhere and it flies all over the place. Well, there's a device called an integrating sphere. And this particular person, the, the, the customer we were doing this for, wanted this to work at radio frequencies. And if you've worked with integrating spheres, they're hundreds to thousands of times the size of a wavelength. And what these are used for, if you have a device that's radiating power, but it's in a particular direction, and we just want to make a fast crude measurement. What's the total power being emitted from that? Well, if it's radiating in a particular direction, maybe you don't know what that is. Now you have to try to measure all these different directions and just getting that total emitted power is difficult. But in an integrating sphere, something very interesting happens. No matter what direction the energy is radiated, the energy distributes itself very evenly around the outside. So you can just sample one point and know immediately what the total radiated power is. Well, at radio frequencies, the wavelength can be a meter long. And so now we're talking about a, you know, an integrating sphere the size of a university campus. Well, that's not good. And so what we've come up with is it doesn't even have to be a sphere, it can be flat. And we will stick a radiator right here in the middle, no matter what direction it radiates, it sort of spirals outward like those um, little fireworks you've ever played with them where they spin around and throw sparks out. 
and it really just chops up the wave and very quickly we get a pretty even distribution of power around the outside so uh, we've made our we've gone from a huge integrating sphere to a very small and compact self uncollimating sphere shouldn't be calling it a sphere it's a a flat little frisbee looking thing okay changing topics again and this is putting periodic structures onto curved surfaces like a meta surface or a frequency selective surface. And this is not an easy problem. And the way I like to explain this, imagine you have a soccer ball and you wanna wrap this with wrapping paper. Maybe you're giving it away as a present. You don't want the pattern on the wrapping paper to get distorted. So how do you wrap the soccer ball without any folds, without any creases and without distorting the pattern? And that's the problem when you try to put a periodic structure down onto a curve. We have to do this in a way that does not distort the pattern or it changes the electromagnetic properties. So here is a flat frequency selective surface. This particular type of element is called a Jerusalem cross, although there's nothing too special about it other than it's something that a lot of people would recognize. And if we shine frequencies at this, uh, what we see is we get this band of transmission where we would get high reflection. We're showing the S21, which is transmission. So we see it as a dip in transmission, but it's also a spike in reflection. So that's the flat frequency selective surface and nothing too special there. Now, what most people do when they put periodic structures onto curves is just project the flat pattern down onto the bowl or the curve. And what you can see is the elements at the top have their correct shape, but since this has been projected, the elements along the side are stretched and, and distorted. And so these no longer electromagnetically work. And so when we try to measure this device, you know, what we see is basically nothing. The electromagnetic properties have vanished. But we can use our algorithm for spatially variant lattices to design this array directly on that very abruptly curved surface. And when we do that, we get the electromagnetic performance back. And in fact, there's even some more things we can do here to improve things even more. So this is something really neat that we're doing now, putting uh, all kinds of structures onto curves, frequency selective surfaces, meta surfaces, phased array antennas, uh, diffraction gratings, guided mode resonance filters, any of these things can be put onto curves. Each one has a slightly different set of things you have to consider when doing that but it's all enabled by this algorithm for generating spatially variant lattices. It's proven to be a really neat tool for us. As far as I know, nobody's been able to do something like this on such an abrupt curve. So here's some neat simulations. They don't tell you anything I haven't already said, but on the left is a simulation of the, of the lattice that was projected down. Of course, that does not work well. Here's the lattice that's been spatially varied on the right, and that completely blocks the incident wave at that frequency where the, the lattice is resonant. So then comes metasurfaces. And as I mentioned before, the idea of a metasurface is that you can bounce a beam off of it and arbitrarily control amplitude phase and polarization uh, across the aperture of that device. And so uh, we have a project right now with the Air Force and we're developing a set of tools to design meta surfaces for imaging applications. And so the idea is that, you know, we could replace a bulky imaging system with something that's flat and simple. And can we exceed the performance of a, a bulky imaging system? We will see, uh, but at the least, we'd like to at least match the performance in something that's much smaller and much more compact. Okay, we're changing topics. As I mentioned before, I don't do real entertaining transitions, so we're just jumping topics, although we will tie this together. And so 3D volumetric circuits. So here we're looking at a flat conventional circuit, and we're not interested in this. We would like to take this circuit and sort of ball it up into a knot. We would like to be able to place electrical components at any position put them in any orientation and route those interconnects along any sort of path, a smooth path. 
And we call this a 3D volumetric circuit. Most people, when you say 3D circuit, they're thinking more stacks of planar circuits. And that's not what we're talking about. In a true 3D circuit, there really is no up, down, left, or right. Uh, everything is just kind of homogeneous and the same, if you will. Now, if this could be done, we have a lot more freedom to place components. So the overall circuit can be much smaller and way less. We can form our circuit into unconventional shapes. Since we can do a more intelligent layout of components, the trace lengths can be shorter. That will improve power efficiency. It will reduce parasitic impedances to increase bandwidth. And there's physics that exists in three dimensions that we just can't effectively, as effectively access in a planar circuit, like anisotropic dielectrics. That's something else I'll be talking about in a bit. So we think these 3D circuits will vastly outperform planar circuits, but there's a lot of problems that have to be overcome. The first problem is how do you make a 3D volumetric circuit? And we are using hybrid 3D printing for this. By hybrid 3D printing, we have a 3D printer that can put down plastics and dielectrics as well as metals to make the, the, the traces. And eventually we'll also be 3D printing the electrical components. Uh, but for now, we're actually inserting discrete electrical components into our circuits. Here's a video of, just to give you an idea, this is in true speed. And you can see us dispensing a conductive silver paste onto a dielectric. This particular device is a uh, dual antenna system for a mobile phone. Here's some other really neat movies that I like to, to show off. So to give you an idea of how gentle and precise this is, so here we're printing an antenna onto an ant. Uh, for a while, I was working on a, a topic called tracking and location of insects, because insects can be trained to go find chemicals and substances, but then how do you find the insect? And so that was some of the questions we had to answer. And you can see we're putting a, an antenna on the, the ant's head. And the second one I think is even a better demonstration of how precise and gentle this is. So that's the wing of a house fly. So just imagine how fragile that is. And what you'll notice is that pattern is being dispensed with barely deflecting that wing at all. So assuming everything is right, it really is a gentle and precise process. So we can do a lot of neat things with it. Now there were no tools for 3D circuits. So we had to develop a whole suite of tools and bring them together to even do this. And so it starts off with schematic capture. Now we didn't write our own schematic capture tool. We use a, a, a tool called dip trace. Nothing special about this. It just happened to be free to us as students and it allowed us to design circuits and it exported everything we needed. We need the component geometries and the net list for how the different interconnects are, are connected. And so then we designed our own custom tool inside of a, a, an open source package called Blender. And our custom add-on for this allows us to design the 3D circuit, to lay out the components and to route the interconnects. So on the left here is a very high speed version. Your video is not choppy. It's a, just a high speed version of, of laying out a particular circuit. But in general, it goes like this. The first thing we do is lay out the components. Components can be at any position and any angle. We then route all of the interconnects and then it exports this as a design. And so you'll have your, your traces, you'll have your dielectric and you'll have where the components are. Now here's where we ran into our second problem. You can buy a hybrid 3D printer today but there's absolutely no software to drive it. So we had to develop our, our whole suite of tools in order to take our 3D circuit designs and convert this into G code that would drive the 3D printer to build the circuit. And so we import the design. We then do something called slicing. And this is where we go layer by layer. And we come up with tool paths of how to deposit the plastic and also how to deposit the metal and we do this all the way through the volume of the part. And we end up exporting what's called a G-code file. And these are the raw instructions to the 3D printer 
that tell it how to build the part. And the G-code files are very simple. It's very little more than a text file that says, turn on dispenser, move here, move here, move here, turn off dispenser, and that's it. It's, it's a very simple kind of almost dumb type of text file for doing that. But all 3D printers are driven that way. So we came up with this full suite of, of tools and it was summer 2018, I believe, is when we produced our first functioning 3D circuit after a lot of trial and error. And this is what you're, you're looking at it being printed. And if we watch long enough, uh, I don't think we'll have enough time to watch it, but you'll see it switch tools from dispensing plastic to dispensing metals. But over on the right here, you can see this circuit at various stages of being fabricated. So that's hybrid 3D printing. And in summer of 2018, we had this huge breakthrough where we made our first functional circuit. We got on the cover of IEEE. And uh, because I'm a mean and cruel professor, the first thing I told my students is I don't like it because it's too square, right? This We want three-dimensional. We want things that break out of any kind of sense of X, Y, Z. And so my students were very happy with me. <laughs> And they end up producing what we now call the holy frijole. Uh, frijole is a Spanish word for a bean because it kind of ended up looking like a bean, but I had a hole through it. And this was just designed to look like absolutely nothing. So you could just realize we can, can form and shape circuits into any shape. And so this was done yeah, just a, a few months later. So you, here's a movie where you can see them. You can see the light blinking. So. It didn't do anything more interesting than that. It blinked the light, but it did work. <laughs> so the world does not have these processes and algorithms. So we're actually working on commercializing this and we're calling this, this product, if you will, OmniFab, that it can make anything. And it does some other cool things. Uh, one thing of interest to a lot of people is off-axis printing, where we're printing at an angle. And we have customers working for a Department of Defense, and they will spend millions of dollars developing 3D printers that have these tilting heads to print off axis. And here we did it with our cheap little MakerBot. It was a software hack, and uh, it didn't need you know real expensive hardware. And another thing of interest is conformal printing. And so this device on the left ends up being this sort of cylinder with a you know curved shape at the top. And what we're doing is we're printing our, our school's logo, a pickaxe on the top of that. So simultaneously, we did off-axis and conformal printing with our cheap little MakerBot printer. And so it just gives you an idea of what a, a modern slicer would do. A slicer is this tool that goes from the, the CAD files to the G code. Changing topics again uh, slightly. This topic we call spatially variant anisotropic metamaterials. Another horrible title. We are not doing a good job of naming things. Uh, way too complicated, I think. So we were playing around a long time ago. And what we're looking at here is a picture of a microstrip transmission line. So we have a ground plane on the bottom. We have a signal line and we launch a signal down that. And we can calculate what the field looks like around that line. And that's what the field looks like embedded in an ordinary isotropic medium. But we asked the question, what would happen if the medium surrounding that transmission line were anisotropic? So what would happen, for example, if the permittivity in the vertical direction was larger than the permittivity in the horizontal direction? And just for fun, we tilted the orientation of the anisotropy. It turned out it had a profound difference, a profound effect on the shape of the field with really minimal impact on how the transmission line itself behaved. Then we said, what if we actually changed the orientation of the anisotropy as a function of position? Well, there it turned out the field followed that. So suddenly here's a mechanism where we can go into the, the very near field around a device and shape these fields like they were clay. What could we do with that? Well, the first thing we did was we, we reduced the coupling between a transmission line and a metal ball. And uh, this is an old graphic, I could do much better now, but what we're looking at is a microstrip transmission line. 
And so imagine it without all this stuff around it. So it just had a microstrip transmission line. We hooked it up to our vector network analyzer. So it pumps a signal out. It goes through the transmission line and back. So when we just have a transmission line there, we get 100% transmission. Then what we did is we took a metal ball up to next to that line and we dropped it down, put that metal ball close to the line, pulled it away and kind of did that. And what we saw, the S11 reflection from that line jumped around. And this blue line kind of gives you an idea of the, the envelope of how much the S11 was jumping around and the S21. So that's transmission and reflection. And that makes sense because the metal ball is near the line and that starts affecting the fields around the line and we get reflections and things like that. Then we designed this spatially variant anisotropic metamaterial, which now this red stuff here is the near field. We actually changed the orientation of the anisotropy in a way that pulled the field away from where the ball would be. Now, when we drop the ball down and pulled it out, this red line shows the, the delta S11 or the change in reflection and almost nothing. And I think this little glitch here was a measurement issue, uh, but almost nothing. And so we have decoupled the metal ball from the transmission line simply by putting some well-designed bumps and grooves in the plastic. And so here's a mechanism in a 3D circuit that's going to have a very strong interference and coupling and crazy stuff between the, the components. One way that we think we can mitigate that. Here's another way to look at this with dielectrics between components. Here we're looking at a cartoon of two different antennas. And so let's say these antennas are too close to each other and they don't work. Well, one way we could make them work is simply by putting them farther apart, but we don't wanna do that. We wanna somehow just electrically stretch the space between them, but physically have those antennas be very close. Well, remember earlier in my talk, I talked about transformation optics. We can define a coordinate transform that would stretch that distance. And when we ask transformation optics, what on earth would do this? Out comes this tensor, this dielectric tensor of what medium we would need to electrically stretch space. And if we stare at this long enough, what we would see is a uniaxial medium and the way we could realize this through some kind of metamaterial is simply with alternating layers of dielectric. So alternating layers of dielectric between those two antennas would electrically stretch space and reduce the coupling between those antennas so they could work when they're a much closer proximity. But now we have to imagine if we have a three-dimensional circuit, we may have dozens of components how do we generate this lattice where we have these alternating layers of dielectric between everything and yet have the layers sort of be smooth and continuous everywhere? And that's, that's the spatially variant lattice stuff again. And so we think circuits in the future will look something like this, where they are three-dimensional, components are in any position, any orientation, interconnects are running throughout this, through the, throughout the volume. And the dielectrics are now also performing functions. And in this case, they're helping isolate electrically components that are in close proximity. But that door swings both ways. We can more tightly couple things. We can engineer radiation patterns of antennas and other things. And to really close the loop on this, now also imagine we have optical interconnects here and doing all kinds of things with optical waveguides. And so that's where I think we'll be way in the future and i hope i'm alive to see all that and i think uh, we're living in exciting times and it's it's all enabled by digital manufacturing 